Hello and welcome to Touching the Sunrise podcast. I am Sister Catherine Herms, author of Surviving Depression, A Catholic Approach, and Reclaim Regret, How God Heals Life's Disappointments, and Spiritual Guide in the Heartwork Program, which specializes in helping people walk the road of spiritual growth and inner healing. For the past 10 years, I have been walking alongside wonderful women and men who want a more heart-centered and spiritual life, but would like support along the way. Through online programs, groups, and one-on-one spiritual guidance, I walk with people along a contemplative and healing path, one that has been trodden for thousands of years. Basically, I'm here to help you surrender to the power of the Holy Spirit who has come to make your being the throne of the Holy Trinity so that your life, your prayer, your relationships, your dreams and goals will most deeply satisfy the desires of your heart. You can find out more about me and what God has led me to do in the world by visiting my website, touchingthesunrise.com. Let's start, as we always do, by reconnecting, remembering, refreshing. Take a deep breath directly into your heart, even deeper than your heart, into that soul, that spirit, that place where divine grace transforms you with the presence, the light, and the life. Of the Divine Trinity. We enter into our inner world, to that sacred space, that inner sanctuary where God dwells. Notice what that room, that space is like. Is it large or small? Is it dark or light? What is the feel of that place? It is in that space, wherever that sacred place for us is, that we experience Jesus calling us his true friend, his darling one, his fair one. We're not used to hearing ourselves called lovely, beautiful, wanted, good. But Jesus looks beyond everything we see in ourselves, and he looks at the motives of our heart. He sees all we have been through, and he wants to free us. He wants to free you. He can look at everything that we would call ugly and messy, and He can still call us lovely, where we see blemishes and pain and sorrow. He sees beauty. He sees our future. All our lives we've sought to be loved and needed. We need His love, only His love, to bring us true healing. We are convinced, no doubt, that God sees us as we see ourselves, but that is not so. God sees us through His own love, His own fidelity, the the pleasure He had in creating us still remains. The dreams he had in making us still fill his heart. And like the hound of heaven, as Francis Thompson said, he's still seeking us out. He's still opening up for us ways into the beauty of his dream for us. God has thought about us all our life, even before we were born. God knew us. And God wants to bring us whole and entire, beautiful, 
into heaven to be with him for all eternity. So let our hearts, let your heart, call out to this God of love. Let us surrender to the work of the Spirit within us. Advent and Christmas are such joyous times of the year. The Christmas carols that we may already be hearing, and as well as the lovely Advent hymns, speak to us of that joy, that joy that seems beyond the world that we know. For we also live these joyous times with the reality of the world events that are part of our life right now even personal events, events in our our lives, in our family's lives, deep within our own heart that may seem dark and sorrowful. So Jesus, the birth of the light of the world, the Prince of Peace, we're, we're, we're looking at this beautiful season, at this great mystery of light and darkness, light and darkness, clarity, mystery, hope, and confusion, sorrow, and despair. Norval Klein, in, he lived in between 1817 and around 1890. He wrote this Christmas carol I'd just like to read because it talks to this. The blasts of chill December sound their farewell of the year. And night's swift shadows gathering round or cloud the soul with fear. But rest you well, good Christian men, nor be of heart forlorn. December's darkness begins again, the light of Christmas morn. The welcome snow at Christmas tide falls shining from the skies. On village paths and uplands wide, all holy white it lies. It crowns with pearl the oaks and pines and glitters on the thorn. And purer is the light that shines on gladsome Christmas morn. Twas when the world was waxing old and night on Bethlehem lay. The shepherds saw the heavens unfold a light upon the day. Such glory ne'er had visited a world with sin outworn, but yet more glorious light is shed on happy Christmas morn. Those shepherds poor, how blessed were they, the angels song to hear, in manger cradle as he lay, to greet their Lord so dear. The Lord of heaven's eternal height, for us a child was born, and he the very light of light, shone forth that Christmas morn. Before his infant smile afar were driven the hosts of hell, and still in souls that childlike are, his guardian love shall dwell. O then rejoice, good Christian men, nor be of heart forlorn. December's darkness brings again the light of Christmas morn. So is the future a mystery, or is it an uncomprehensible puzzle? When we look at history with the light of the incarnation, the light of the birth of the Son of God on earth, that Christmas morn in Bethlehem over 2,000 years ago, at a point in history, the Son of God, the Word of God, We ask, is the future a mystery, an incomprehensible mystery that we can't know with with our, our minds? We can't figure out, we can't even see with our natural eyes. Or is it darkness, incomprehensible, an enigma? Is it an excess of light? Or is it an excess of darkness? Which of these is the real reason that we cannot see what is truly happening in the world, in the world even now? We can ask the same about God. 
Is God a mystery? Is he an excess of light so immense that we're unable to truly see him? It's like looking into the eyes of the sun. We have to close our eyes, not because the sun is dark, but because the sun is so light. We have to gradually grow in this capacity to see, this capacity to gaze, this capacity then to understand with the heart. Or is God darkness? Is he ununderstandable? Is he a puzzle? Does he shut down? Or does he open us up? At the very beginning of the Gospel of John, we read these words about light and darkness, and they are read in one of the uh, Gospels on Christmas Day, I believe. In the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him, and nothing was created except through him. The Word gave life to everything that was created, and his life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. These words that were written in the Gospel of John echo words that were written maybe a thousand years earlier by the prophet Isaiah, and he wrote, The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. For those who live in a land of deep darkness, a light will shine. I particularly like this line because it doesn't say the people who walk in darkness will figure out where the light is. It says the people who walk in the darkness will see a great light. That light will reveal itself to them. It will come from outside them. It will shine in their darkness. It will lead them to learn, to grow, to be, to see, to gaze, and to understand. Isaiah, of course, is our companion, a very close companion during the Advent season in the readings of the Masses, those four weeks. And of course, Isaiah lived and prophesied at a time of great threat from the Assyrian powers in the kingdom of Israel and also of Judah. Isaiah prophesies the coming of the reign of God in the midst of this turmoil and confusion and fear. He prophesied a kingdom of justice and peace. He urged those who read his prophecies, who listened to him, to obey the Lord's instruction, to walk in the ways of peace, to follow the promptings of the Spirit, to be just in thought, word, and deed. The Church presents to us Advent as a time of mystery, a time to be filled with hope. Even as the world is more dark, the darkness comes earlier and the light comes later in the morning, um, we, we live that time in physically greater darkness. For us, Advent is a time of hope, of light, of the promise of glad tidings and welcoming the Messiah, the light of the world. Through the entire Bible, there is this consistent story about light expelling the darkness. And it begins at the very, very beginning in the pages of Genesis, at the beginning of creation, when there is nothing but darkness. But then God spoke. And he used the words, let there be light. Let there be light. And light dawned for the first time in creation. The darkness was dispelled by light. And life then could be born. 
Actually, when Jesus was born, it was also a time of darkness. It was a time in which the Hebrew people were living under the Roman Empire, which was an oppressive rule over them. They lived under the reign of Caesar Augustus, who was an emperor who loved his power, his privilege, his wealth. And he wanted to protect it at the expense of the Jewish people. Herod the Great was a governor of Jerusalem, and he was coming to the end of a very long and bloody career. He ruled through tactics of terror. He watched the Jewish people very closely because he wanted to maintain his control. Not only this, the competing sects in the Jewish people among themselves, in which they were divided within themselves, led to a constant friction, and this only increased the oppressive rule of Rome. So riots were common, there was unceasing tension, there was little unified Jewish identity, and people were growing increasingly hopeless. So you could say that the first century Palestinian world was a world that was growing increasingly dark. It was a world filled with crisis and tension, a world on the brink of chaos, a world not unlike our own. I'd like to read to you just a paragraph from Alfred Delp's prison letters. Alfred Delp was a German Jesuit priest. He was born in 1907 and he died in 1945. He was falsely implicated in a failed 1944 plot to overthrow Adolf Hitler. Because of this, he was arrested and sentenced to death, and he was executed on February 2nd, 1945, in Berlin. And he wrote this about Advent. Advent is a time of promise. It is not yet the time of fulfillment. We are still in the midst of everything and in the logical inexorability and relentlessness of destiny. Space is still filled with the noise of destruction and annihilation, the shouts of self-assurance and arrogance, the weeping of despair and helplessness. But round about the horizon, the eternal realities stand silent in their age-old longing. There shines on them already the first mild light of the radiant fulfillment to come. From afar sound the first notes as of pipes and voices, not yet discernible as a song or melody. It is all far off still and only just announced and foretold. But it is happening today. The beautiful thing I think that he's saying about Advent is Advent is not going to lead us to a Christmas morn of fulfillment, of total joy, of this is it. We've got it all figured out. The Prince of Peace has come. War is over. Advent is but, as he says, um, the first mild light the first mild dawning, the very first smidgen of light on the horizon of what Jesus is and of the kingdom that will reign forever and ever, of eternal life, of eternal glory, when the King of Kings will come and all of creation will bow their knee before him. Advent is only a tiny light, a smidgen of the dawn of that beautiful time. And we hear, as he says from afar, as if we just heard a few chords, voices here and there, not yet discernible, the song, the melody of eternity. It's still, he says, far off. It's only just announced. It's only foretold. But it is happening today. So even though we listen again and again in the Advent season to the foretelling, to the foretelling of God's complete redemption, a 
of creation of all of us of the world it is only a foretelling but it is happening even today we may also be bearing the sorrow of a loss at this time of year or maybe this year and we ask then how can we be joyful how can we believe that Jesus birth on this earth is anything but a fairy tale for me a false promise of something that has been undelivered it comes down to the question is the future full of mystery or is it full of darkness and unexplainable enigmas everything turns on this question the answer to this question what is mystery as we said before mystery is an excess of light so much so that we can't open our eyes we can't see or comprehend or know with our natural eyes with our with our natural reason with our logic our natural knowing it is a positive prospect it's mystery is full of trust and hope on the other hand enigma these unexplainable puzzles these dead ends in darkness are an excess of the dark they're the complete opposite of mystery which is a fullness of light it is able to kill our life this darkness and our testimony as Christians in the world so let's just take a moment to look at the difference between mystery and enigma I read this story of a woman a long time ago whose husband had died unexpectedly and what I remember of the story is that she rushed to home. She was away at the time. She rushed to his bedside. She put down her head and she said, The Lord has given and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That story has haunted me for years. I can't get it out of my mind because there is something real and true that she saw it did not take away her pain her grief but she was able to see the mystery of life and death even in the darkness so let's look at mystery and enigma mystery is relational it knows and communicates itself to us enigmas are impenetrable they're these puzzles that we can't figure out mysteries leave us with a sense of hope of searching of the sense that there is a meaning though we aren't able maybe to grasp it right now that there is the hope that there is meaning in this situation or in life that in some way God is reaching out to us even here. Mystery is full of sense. It offers us the possibility of making sense out of life. Mystery draws us to itself and therefore we can contemplate mystery. Mystery provokes us to enlarge our horizons, to see beyond. Mystery asks great things of us. The greatest that we can possibly give which is why we resist mystery we struggle against mystery on some level of our being because it is asking something immense of us mystery points out the truth that there is a goal there is an objective toward which we walk every day with our own two legs um, it opens up to us a future that we feel is friendly friendly to us that we feel has hope for us mystery leads to the divine enigma is just the opposite when we face life the world's situation situations with our own within our own world as an enigma we feel that there is no horizon beyond what we are currently feeling and experiencing 
um, we may feel that it makes no sense and could never make sense. Because of that, we don't feel called to grow, to expand. We don't feel that there is anything beautiful about the future. Instead, we feel desperation and fear. We feel uncertain about the future or we see it as an enemy and we're host that it's hostile to us. And Enigma believes that truth doesn't exist in the world, that there is no real direction to walk. And so it's very scattered. We're very dispersed. We feel like there's nowhere to go, nowhere to grow. When we live in the midst of things and life as if they were an enigma. Christmas is amazing when we look at it from the realms of mystery in this light. Mystery is relational. God came to earth to be one with us. In that babe that we see in the manger, in the manger on Christmas morn, God came to be one with us. He sent his son to take on our nature, to walk with us, to suffer with us, to die with us, to die for us, to rise for us, to raise us up in himself. God communicated through a relationship with us that will never end. Mystery sends messages and signs that wants to be known. All through the prophets in the Old Testament, their messages and the signs that they gave, they were telling us about the coming of the Messiah, the coming of the light of the world, the coming of the suffering servant, as Isaiah talks about, who himself would suffer and die for us. And today, we still receive those messages, those signs. We have the Word of God, the Word read in the uh, Liturgy of the Word at Mass. We can read the Gospels. We can read the Bible. We can pray. We can receive the Eucharist. We can meet God. We can meet Jesus in the Sacrament of Reconciliation. Mysteries, we're able to see them. They invite us to to touch something, to see something beyond what is apparent to our senses. And I love this quote from uh, the words that uh, the Apostle John again uses about the gospel. He says, we have written and shared with you what we have seen and touched, what our eyes have heard. We think of the healings of Jesus where he touched blind eyes or the woman with the hemorrhage who touched just a tassel of his cloak and was healed. Um, we can think of doubting Thomas when Jesus said, Blessed are you, happy are you. You see me and you believe, but blessed are they who do not see me. And yet, belief. We see him and we touch him in mystery now. Mystery makes sense out of life. It offers us the possibility of making sense out of life. So this child born in Bethlehem begins at the very beginning to confuse, in a sense, our worldly ideas of what is true, what's, uh, what's, uh, he turns everything upside down. So God is born a baby. You know, he takes on flesh. He's totally dependent. Um, he's poor. He has to escape for his life. He becomes an immigrant in Egypt, a refugee in Egypt. He's taught by his human mother and human foster father, St. Joseph. As he grows, um, as he himself begins to teach, he teaches us the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the single-hearted. Blessed are you when you mourn. Blessed are you when you are persecuted. He helps us to make sense out of life beyond what we can see. And we can look at St. Paul who must have reflected on so much of what 
was available at his time because the Gospels weren't written about the life of Jesus, which, which he must have heard from those who had lived with him. And he wrote in the second letter to the Corinthians, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, works for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. And in the letter to the Romans, he wrote, I consider that our present sufferings are not comparable to the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the revelation of the sons of God. Mystery, mystery wants good. It wants the good and it wants the good for us. Jesus said, to his apostles at the Last Supper, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. The mystery provokes us. It causes us to enlarge in our horizons. Jesus says in the Gospel of John chapter 15, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. Mystery. It is in prayer that we learn to comprehend, to contemplate mystery, to, to gaze at God, and to allow ourselves to be seen by him, to live under his gaze, to be welcomed and embraced by him, to be filled with his luminous gaze, that gaze that illuminates all of reality, everything in our life, even those things which seem difficult and impossible to understand, things such as sorrow, death, failure, sin, Injustice, demands, crises. If we see the future as mystery, God as mystery, then we are called out of ourselves. We're called out of ourselves again and again. We're called out of ourselves when we have to decide whether or not to greet someone, to stop and help someone when we're in a hurry about our business. What do we do when someone says hurtful gossip about someone else and we're there listening, hearing what they say? How do we respond when someone hurts us? What do we do with those ugly thoughts that come into our heads? Do we let them stay there or do we fight them? Do we, do we choose thoughts of life, light, and peace? God as mystery calls us out of ourselves, just as Jesus born in Bethlehem has called all of history out of itself into the light of the kingdom, into the light of God's love for us. Our days can seem so small, our times can seem dark, but it is precisely into these days and into this time that the Lord speaks words of great significance. These words are, I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. And I am the light of the world. You are the light of the world. As these days of Advent now come to a close where we live this season of hope which through all the busyness and the demands that are put upon us to make that season and the Christmas uh, 
season such a beautiful time for others, um, these days can quickly run to fatigue. Um, we may long for that yearning, that Advent, that hope that Advent brings to us when we hear in the hymns and the carols and the readings at Mass, where we can find ourselves easily becoming quarrelsome and frustrated in the demands of the day. Walter Brueggemann has this wonderful phrase where he asks God to give us the grace and the impatience to wait for your coming to the bottom of our toes and to the edges of our fingertips. And we close asking for this grace that through our entire being filled with light, filled with the light of the world, we can wait for his coming, not just on Christmas Day, but wait for his coming, the coming of the kingdom to the bottom of our toes, to the edges of our fingertips, as he says. And so we pray that God comes in his power and in his weakness and that on this Christmas in our lives, all things will be made new. Thank you. God has amazing ways of knocking on people's hearts, awakening desires, arousing questions, provoking an unexpected spiritual fire. Remember, if you'd like some extra support and are ready to embark on a sustained spiritual journey, you can connect with me in a number of ways by going to my website, touchingthesunrise.com. So until the next time, take care of yourself. And remember that you are not alone. You are loved no matter what. And when you search within yourself, you will not only find yourself, but the throne of the Divine Trinity. You have a calling, a mission, and every gift, every grace, every moment, even every fall, mistake, and sin is a step toward your completely and wholly being taken up into the mystery of God's love for you and for all creation. Remember always that you have a treasure of inexpressible joy hidden in an earthen vessel, small and fragile. May this overflowing joy fill you and yours with this fragrance. God be with you.